Thank you, Mark. We are continuing our studies in Jeremiah, and we are coming to the end of it. Next week will be the last lesson, but this morning we're in chapter 45. So I'm going to read this chapter and then uh, join with me in prayer. Jeremiah 45, this is the message which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written down these words in a book at Jeremiah's dictation. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel to you, O Baruch. You said, Ah, woe is me. For the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning and have found no rest. Thus you are to say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am about to tear down. And what I have planted, I am about to uproot. That is the whole land. But you, are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I am going to bring disaster on all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you, your life to you as booty in all the places where you may go. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Solomon asked in Ecclesiastes 6.12, Who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? In other words, who knows what we should seek in life and our ambitions should be? Most people, I think, would answer that, no one knows better than I do what's good for me. And they follow their own ambitions to gain security and happiness but that doesn't always work out so well. What we think is good may be bad. There's no better example of that, at least in the Bible, than Lot. He, his herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen feuded, and so Abraham wanted peace and said, let's separate. You choose. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot, you remember, lifted up his eyes and he saw the Jordan Valley that was well watered. It was like the Garden of God. And so that's where Lot moved and we're told he pitched his tent towards Sodom where his green pastures became a desert, all his gain loss, and his life misery. Who knows what is good for a man? God knows what is good. He knows everything. And He has spoken. So the wise person listens to Him. In Matthew 6, verse 33, the Lord said, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In the words of the Catechism, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Do that, and you will have what is good. Whatever profession you choose and whatever comes into your life. Now that's Jeremiah 45, where the Lord spoke through his prophet to give advice to Baruch, Jeremiah's associate and helper in the ministry. It was actually a rebuke. He asked, but you, are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them. That counsel is not only for Baruch, it's for all people. Seek not great things for yourself. Seek them for God. Chapter 45 is unusual for a couple of reasons. It's brief. Just five verses. But it's also out of sequence with the rest of the book. According to verse 1, it occurred in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. But it is placed after chapter 44, 
which was years later after Jerusalem had fallen, the nation had been carried off to Babylon, and Jeremiah and Baruch had been taken down to Egypt. So we naturally wonder why it is placed out of the book's chronological order. It's not sloppy editing, we know that. It, it must have been done for a purpose. And I think the clue to that purpose is found in the chapter. It's found in verse 5 where God promises to spare Baruch's life and protect his life wherever he went, especially in hard places. And by the end of chapter 44, he and Jeremiah were in a very hard place. They were in Egypt, taken there by some apostate Jews. It was not where they wanted to be. They had protested against that, but there they were, and there they survived, and there they ministered. God protects His servants. He promised to do that for Jeremiah, you remember, in chapter 1 when he was called to be a prophet and there God promised to make him a pillar of iron. And He did that till His mission was done. He promised to protect Baruch. I will give your life to you as booty or as a prize in all the places where you may go. He did that for him, even down in Egypt. His promises are reliable. And that, I think, is the point of the editing. Putting this chapter with the promise of life that God gave years earlier at the end of these events to show that God keeps His word. We can trust Him. Who was Baruch? One of the commentators called him a shadowy figure. Not a shady character, but, but a person in the shadows of whom we have learned little so far in the book. We know he was a scribe who followed Jeremiah and served him, writing down his uh, prophecies and recording the events of his life. We know about Jeremiah largely because of what Baruch wrote. So maybe he was a little bit like James Boswell, who was the constant companion of the lexicographer and playwright Samuel Johnson in the 1700s. He observed him. He wrote a biography on him. He collected all of Johnson's statements. Some of them are very famous, like patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Boswell wrote all about Samuel Johnson, but he also wrote a lot about himself. Baruch didn't do that. But we learn things here in verse 1 about him. He's the son of Neriah, and we learn later on in chapter 51 of his brother, Sariah, who was also the son of Neriah. And so that brother of his, Sariah, was an officer in the court of King Zedekiah. So it would seem that uh, Baruch had some connections with the palace. He may have been from a noble family. He was a scribe, so he was well educated. His name means blessed. But Baruch didn't feel blessed. And the Lord exposed to him the thoughts of his heart in verse 3. Ah, oh, woe is me. Baruch was depressed, depressed about his circumstances, and he blamed the Lord. For the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning and have found no rest. The book of Jeremiah gives a, a very human look at the, the leading figures of this book. We've talked about that before, but it exposes their frailties that are really true of all of us. We can really identify with these individuals. We see ourselves in them. Jeremiah complained bitterly about his situation. In chapter 20, he accused God of deceiving him after he was beaten and put in the stocks for prophesying. That's almost blaspheming the Lord God, blaspheming. You've deceived me, he said. And then he cursed the day that he was born. Now that's despair. That's discouragement in the prophet. And now here, the, the scribe and disciple of the prophet is complaining as well. Every child of God is a saint. 
but not always very saintly. We all struggle with doubt and disappointment in hard times. In fact, if, if we're not, we might wonder if we're really in the spiritual battle. Because when we are, our faith is going to be challenged. We're going to be tested. And that's never pleasant. That's always hard. That happened to Baruch. We're not told why he was down. We saw a couple of weeks ago that in the first part of chapter 36, Jeremiah was told to write down all the words of his prophecy on a scroll, and he did that by dictating it to Baruch. And then Baruch was told to go to the temple and read it to the people in the hope that when they heard the message, they would repent of their rebellion and they would be forgiven. Well, that was in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, chapter 36, which is the year of chapter 45 here, the fourth year of Jehoiakim. It wasn't until the fifth year we learn from chapter 36 that Baruch did that. The, the book was written down in the fourth year, but it's in not until the fifth year that Baruch goes to the temple and reads the prophecy. So that, there is a lapse of time there. You might wonder, why is that? We're not told, but maybe it was due to fear on Baruch's part. He was to read the scroll to this stiff-necked people, as Moses described Israel. They were just as stiff-necked in Jeremiah's day as they were in Moses' day. They were an evil people, people who... Uh, had, had treated Jeremiah harshly. It was a difficult audience to speak to, to read to, to preach to. One that did not listen to the words that were given, ignored and rejected the Word of God. And so he knew what he was going into. And it may have been that that he was agonizing over. He had, may have been worrying about his own safety of, of fearing the rejection he might experience of being humiliated by the crowd, fear of suffering. It's interesting to read about the, uh, the old evangelists like Whitfield and Wesley and those who preached with them and the abuse they suffered, the, the ridicule that was hurled at them, the, the rocks and mud and rotten eggs that were thrown at them. Now that, that can take a toll. That can get old really quick. Baruch had witnessed that in Jeremiah's ministry, so maybe he was uh, fearful of undergoing it himself. Would be unusual if, if there was no concern or fear on his part. But the context and correction the Lord gives him suggests something else. Not so much fear of physical harm as disappointment with the direction of his life. Disappointment with the prospects of his career. He was well educated. No doubt he'd made sacrifices to become a, a scribe. That took time and effort. But his reputation was so linked to Jeremiah that it was ruined among his peers and, and any hope of promotion, of advancing in his career was gone. C.S. Lewis was passed over for professorship at Oxford more than once because of his Christian books and Christian life, and it was a bitter experience for him. Now, that may have been Baruch's experience. I've been faithful, he thought, and what has it profited me? The Lord has added sorrow to my pain. So he may have wondered if it was all worth it. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, Peter and the disciples had a similar complaint or similar concern. Behold, Peter said, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Are we sacrificing everything for nothing? No, of course they weren't. But it's very hard to take the long view on things, the long view on life, to see into the future. The, the present is where we live. The present is what is real to us. The future is known to us 
at least to the believer, through God's Word, through His promises, and through His prophecies. And we read them, and we think about them, and we are assured of them by faith. Not by sight, but by faith. We begin believing that it's true. Sometimes that's very difficult to do when the circumstances are hard and seem to deny everything about the promise and the prophecy. And that's when we live by faith. That's when we trust Him. In the, in the difficult times, in the challenging times, whatever his situation, Baruch was clearly weary. He was experiencing pain and sorrow and was blaming God for it. Woe is me. Other people were better off than he was. He was feeling sorry for himself when God answered him through the prophet. I'm sure the answer surprised Baruch. He, wa he wanted sympathy, I suspect. He got perspective. Perspective we all need. First of all, you'll notice that God didn't deny that He'd added sorrow to Baruch's pain. He didn't deny that He had called Baruch to a hard life and a challenging ministry. He doesn't correct Baruch's statement. Baruch described the difficulty pretty well. What he did was correct Baruch's attitude and told him, in effect, you're not looking at things correctly. Be thankful and selfless. But first, in verse 4, he declares that he's sovereign over the affairs of men. Not only does he know what is happening, he's directing the events. He has a plan, and he's working out that plan. Verse 4, Thus you are to say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am about to tear down. And what I have planted, I am about to uproot. That is, the whole land. Now there's something very practical in that statement because it was a way of saying to Baruch that he knew where Baruch's life and career were headed. And it was all in God's hands. Whose hands do you want your life in? God's or your own? You want to be a success in life? Of course you do. We all want to be a success in whatever we do. Who do you want to trust for that? God or someone else? God had a plan for the nation Judah, as He has a plan for the world. It is wise and infallible and irresistible, inevitable. Isn't it better to fit obediently into His plan than follow one of our own design? And so the Lord reminds Baruch of His sovereignty and His purpose, and then in verse 5, He gives personal counsel to Baruch about his ambition. But you, are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I'm going to bring disaster on all flesh, declares the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize of war in all the places where you may go. What was his ambition? Well, we don't know. We can speculate. Was it to be a great scribe? Was it to be a leading scholar respected among his people? Maybe I've suggested that that was it, but some have thought something else, they, that he envisioned himself as a deliverer of his people, and he, he hoped to leave behind a great name for himself, maybe like, like a Moses, but he realized that would not happen. Well, whatever his ambition, God warned him against seeking Greatness for himself since judgment was coming and all of these things that he might have valued were going to be swept away. Whatever men achieve in this world doesn't last. Men can't imagine that, but, but think of some of the most famous of them. Men like Alexander the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Napoleon said, great ambition is the passion of a great character. And he would have thought that. He, he was the son of a small Corsican family, and he became emperor of France. He ruled most of Europe for a time. Alexander conquered the known world and was worshipped as a god. You still have found coins all over that part of the world with Alexander's image on them. You can see them in some of the museums of the world. But his life descended into paranoia, alcoholism, and murder. And when he died at the young age of 32, his great empire fell apart. Napoleon's life ended in exile as a prisoner on a small, damp island in the Atlantic, living in a house full of rats. Seeking great things doesn't always result in lasting things. All that being said, I don't think the Lord was warning Baruch against seeking great things. The important word here is yourself. Seeking great things for yourself. Napoleon wasn't altogether wrong when he said, great ambition is the passion of a great character. The question is, what is the object of one's ambition? Is it to glorify self or is it to glorify God? Paul's ambition was to preach the gospel in Rome and then carry it on to Spain. He wanted to represent Christ faithfully before Jews and Gentiles. He was seeking great things. He didn't care about himself, about being the successor of Gamaliel, of having a seat on the Sanhedrin. At one time he did. No doubt that was his ambition as a young man. But then he met Christ and everything changed. And then he called all of that rubbish. What he cared about was gaining Christ. Why is it all rubbish? Why were the honors of the world and the wealth and the fame that we can accrue in this world worthless to the apostle. For the very reason the Lord told Baruch not to seek them for himself. They aren't permanent. They don't last. They're all going to burn up someday. Do not seek them, he said, for behold, I am going to bring disaster on all flesh. Now that had historical applications, specific application to Judah, the Lord was bringing judgment on that faithless, sinful, rebellious, apostate nation. Babylon was coming. God would use that army to tear down what he had built. The Lord might have added, and then where will your great things be? The world, as Baruch knew it, its institutions, its great schools, was coming to an end. That was the Lord's decree. That was God's decree. It happened, and by way of application to us, it will happen on a far grander scale to the world. Peter tells us that in 2 Peter 3, that the earth and all its works will be burned up. So then he asks... Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Well, the question answers itself. What kind of people ought we to be? In? We ought to be people of holy conduct and godliness. We ought to be people who are investing in the future, in what lasts, in what is eternal, in a new heavens and new earth. And we do that by being godly in the present. By following the Lord and obeying Him. Putting that first. Glorifying the Lord God. That's what the Lord was telling Baruch. Seeking great things for yourself is futile. Seek great things for the Lord. That's what pleases the Lord. And that is what He blesses every day. William Carey, who spent his life and a hard life on the mission field in India, had as his motto, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. 
And we don't need to leave home for the foreign mission field to, uh, to do that. We do it daily by seeking to glorify God in all that we do, wherever we are, in the little things, in the big things, whatever. We do that by seeking to glorify Him because that is the chief end of man. That's the purpose of life. It comes down to that. Seek to glorify Him. Paul makes that point in an interesting way. I quote this periodically, but it's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, where he says, Whatever you do, from the sublime to the mundane, from the remarkable to the common, do all to the glory of God. The way he puts it, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Eating, drinking, you can glorify God on that? Yes. I think his point is, in the small things, the mundane things, you're to seek to glorify Him. Well, obviously, in the big things, in the grand scheme of things, you're also to seek to glorify Him. And we do that by being obedient. But there's a right way to be obedient. And the bottom line is, we are required to be obedient. Whether we want to be obedient or not, we're to be obedient. But the right way to obey the Lord the way that is pleasing to Him and effective for us. The true way to obey Him is to obey out of love for Him, out of gratitude to Him for all that He is and all that He's done for us and He will yet do for us and what He's presently doing for us. We, we, we get that thankfulness from knowing Him what He's done for us, and thinking about that and reflecting upon that. And as we understand that, we grow in our love for Him, and that affects everything that we do. Our work ethic is governed by that principle of seeking to glorify God because we love Him and we're thankful for what He's done for us. Our family life is governed by this principle of the, of the glory of God. Our private life is governed by that principle of seeking to glorify God. So when you're out on the highway and someone tries to cut you off, glorify God in that. I, I was in that situation the other day and someone almost cut me off. And I didn't try to glorify God, I will admit that. But uh, that's me. I have a lot of growing to do myself. Now this is what pleases the Lord. And this is what lasts. There is not one thing done for the Lord to glorify Him that does not count for all eternity and that He won't reward. Now think about that for a moment. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If you eat to the glory of God, if you do the smallest thing to the glory of God, he recognizes that. He will reward that eternally. There's not a thing we can do for Him that He doesn't take account of that and bless us for all eternity in it. Baruch's reward, at least the part that is mentioned here for his faithful service, was that he would escape with his life. I'm going to bring disaster on all flesh, but I will give your life to you as a prize, a prize of war in all places where you may go. Baruch would not get the great things of the world, its honors and comforts, but he would be a survivor. And we know from the rest of the story that he and Jeremiah escaped the judgment. But the story ends with them being taken down into Egypt where they didn't want to go. They protested that. But they were abducted, kidnapped as it were, which might seem rather anticlimactic, less than expected. doesn't seem like a blessing at all. And yet chapters 46 through 51 are prophecies that Jeremiah gave from Egypt about the nation, about the nation's that Baruch recorded for him. Maybe God was saying, this is the right place for you to be in Egypt, the, like, the, like the quintessential Gentile nation, to write about the nations. But there they were, that's where he put them, in a very dark place. But there in that dark place, 
they ministered, and the Lord was with them continually, protecting them. Life took a strange twist for them. It wasn't something they had anticipated, but it was all part of God's plan for them, and it was the right place for them to be ministering and protected. Circumstances for Christians don't always turn out the way we might uh, hope pleasantly. They don't always do that. But then this world isn't the end. This world is a very brief place for us. And what it is is a battlefield on the way to the end, on the way to what is permanent. And so in this brief life of ours, in this world, we can expect difficulty and disappointment. The Lord has not promised us comfortable lives. In the world you have tribulation, He told His disciples. That's how He concludes His upper room discourse in chapter 16 of John. You're going to have tribulation in this world. Especially when they were in the service of the Lord before the world. And we can expect the same thing. We're going to serve Him Expect tribulation. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. But he added, take courage, I have overcome the world. And, and the assurance in that is that he would be with them continually as he is with us continually. He was with the prophet and his scribe when they were prisoners in Egypt. Prisoners in Egypt, what a place to be. Well, at the end of the book of Acts, Paul was a prisoner in Rome. He had planned to go there, but not in chains. Still, the book of Acts ends triumphantly with Paul imprisoned, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. It's an amazing thing when you... Consider it and consider all that we learn about that imprisonment. It wasn't Paul's plan. It was the Lord's plan. And we know from the book of Philippians that through his incarceration, the apostle met people that he might not have met otherwise. He was chained to Roman soldiers, members of the Praetorian Guard, Caesar's elite unit of personal bodyguards. They heard the gospel. And the gospel, we're told, spread into Caesar's own household. Now, that's amazing. Paul could not have planned that. And if Paul had somehow worked out a plan, he couldn't have pulled that off. This was God's plan. He knows best. It was the outworking of divine providence. And it was the same with Jeremiah and Baruch. Matthew Henry put it well in a quote that I often give, and I had to give, Mike Black was sitting there this morning, and I gave him credit because he's the one that gave me this quote, but it is uh, in Matthew Henry's commentaries on his commentary on Proverbs chapter 3, in which he wrote, in all our conduct we must be diffident, which means cautious. In all our conduct we must be cautious of our own judgment and confident of God's wisdom, power, and goodness, and therefore must follow providence and not force it. Don't, don't fall into schemes and seek to manipulate circumstances so that you can get your way. You don't know what your way, the best thing for you is. Wait on the Lord. Follow providence. Well, that brings us back to Solomon and the question that he asked in Ecclesiastes 6.12. Who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? In other words, be cautious of your own judgment. Don't trust in yourself. We cannot know what is going to happen in our lives one second from now. We can't see beyond the immediate moment. We're like a description that I read of the Federal Reserve Board walking through a dark room with sunglasses. Years ago, I drove up to Oklahoma City to, to preach in a church, and I left early in the morning, uh, but still the schedule was somewhat tight. When I got to the Arbuckle Mountains, it was getting light, 
but there was a fog, and it was a thick fog. And when I entered it, I could not see one inch in front of the car. And I faced a dilemma. If I stopped, someone might run into me. If I kept going, I might run into someone. I kept driving. Life is like that. It is precarious. It is foolish to think that we control it. Calvin wrote on that in his Institutes. Very good section, a very good statement where he spoke of the innumerable evils and deaths that threaten us daily. Like a man who has a sword perpetually hanging over his neck. It's the the knowledge, he said, of divine providence. The knowledge that God is absolutely sovereign, he wrote, that sets us free from extreme anxiety and fear so that we fearlessly dare to commit ourselves to God. Otherwise, we we would be foolish to ever go out of our houses. But knowing that God's in control of everything, that our lives are in His hands, that every moment of our life is His, Well, that gives us confidence. Therefore, we must follow providence and not force it. Certainly, we need to to plan for the future and work hard to achieve our plans. This isn't fatalism. But as James explains, we're to make our plans in light of God's will and trust His providence. He may not will for us to go to that city or this city You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor, he said. So say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Here's what we can say for certain. It is the Lord's will that we live for His glory, not our own. That we seek great things for Him, not ourselves. He knows and sees what we cannot know or see. So we are to live obediently to His Word and we are to trust Him for what comes. Walk by the Spirit. That's really what we're talking about. Living by faith. And He will bless that. Horatius Bonar put it well, I think, in his hymn that he wrote in the 1800s. Thy way, not mine, O Lord. Thy way, not mine, O Lord. However dark it be, lead me by Thine hand. Choose out the path for me. I dare not choose my lot. I would not if I might. Choose Thou for me, my God. So shall I walk aright. Well, that's wisdom. Who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? Not man, only God knows what's best for us. And and He will guide us as we trust in Him. Baruch did. God protected him in Egypt. And when he edited the book of Jeremiah, he put this chapter here under the Spirit's guidance to show that God had kept His promise of protection and to show, I think, that He'd gained that divine wisdom. Our perspective on life in the present, should be set by God's plan for the future. Peter told us what that is. There will be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is glorious. That's our hope. That's what we look forward to. So if you wonder in a moment of trial, in a moment of testing, is it worth it? If we ever ask ourselves what the disciples asked the Lord, what then will there be for us? Remember 2 Peter chapter 3. Or remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard all that God has prepared for those who love Him. It's beyond our comprehension what He has prepared for us. Here in this world, we are a vapor. Briefly here. But in this brief time, we are gaining what lasts for eternity. So by His grace, may we serve Him by living faithfully to His glory and by telling others 
of His grace, which is free to all who come to Him, who come to Christ. If you've not believed, we invite you to come to Him through faith alone. That's how we come. Not by our merit, not by anything we've done or we can possibly do. It is through faith alone. It is by an understanding of what He's done for us and receiving it, trusting in that, trusting in Him and realizing your need of the Savior. Realizing that you're lost and you're guilty, but Christ died for the guilty and receives all who come to Him. So trust in Him for forgiveness and life everlasting. And then, by God's grace, may we seek His kingdom. May we seek to glorify Him in all that we do. Let's stand in conclusion and sing hymn number 12 in the Songs of Praise book, His Mercy is More, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 12. Father, we do thank You. It's true, our sins are many, but Your mercy is more, and uh, we are debtors to mercy alone. Thank You for it. May we understand that more clearly, and may we seek to live lives that bring glory to You. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.